In this video net interview I'm speaking with Dr Paul Stannard and Matthew Goldman who are both from the CTO group at Ericsson's TV business. Hi both of you. Hi. Hello. Um, do you think that uh, compression is still as relevant as it was 10 years ago given that we've seen such a dramatic increase in the bandwidth over terrestrial networks? Yes, absolutely. What, what's continuing to happen is the amount of content that consumers want is basically an insatiable appetite. So just the sheer amount of new content that becomes available is ever increasing and particularly the bandwidth demands are more now because the picture quality is considered very high and so uh, there's a lot of content that's being changed to high definition at this point in time which of course increases demand in the network. That is now coupled with the our, the, 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 our, our children in the digital uh, millennium generation which uh, not only want all the different content, but they want it on every device that's available and they want it instantaneously, 100% network connected. So that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on a network to be much more efficient, you know, efficiently used. Okay, so it's a combination of the quality and also the, the sheer quantity. Yes. Okay. I mean, um, I mean, we've seen the sort of development of MPEG-2 and I know that you've been sort of upgrading MPEG-2 really. And is that because we have to simulcast everything still in HD and SD? The, the, the need for simulcast, of course, puts an even further demand on the network, but what it really comes down to is that the uh, traditional ways of, of broadcasting is a fixed uh, network availability. So if you have more content then, and you have a fixed or, uh, ceiling of what you can use, then it pushes it beyond the capabilities of MPEG-2, and that's why we've seen recently uh, the shifting towards MPEG-4 or ABC. And uh, we're now reaching a point where some of the new networks are out there, particularly like for the DSL configurations, which the amount of bandwidth that's available decreases at the distance to get a longer reach and to do multiple services in the home because it used to be a time when there was one television and that one television was standard definition. Now there's multiple televisions and many times multiple high definition. So in order to deliver that variety of programming, it puts an even bigger stress point on the network. Okay, and Paul, I mean, <coughs> MPEG-4 is still maturing. Um, do we need to start looking before him, beyond MPEG-4 yet, do you think, uh, another generation of compression? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we obviously still see a lot of um, growth, and, and you know, we, we, we predict MPEG-4 to be going for, for a long time, but um, obviously we're always investing in, in looking at new algorithms and, and what, what will happen in the future to make sure that we can we can keep keep ahead of, of, of these trends. I mean, we, we, we do see this, as we talked about, this, this growing amount of content. We know that the network operators um, are predicting 90% sort of, of the traffic on their IP networks is going to be video within the next few years. Um, and really, we need to be looking and continuously looking at how we can... Um, how we can reduce the impact of all this video and um, you know we're, we're doing that in a number of ways and obviously compression is, is is an important element of that as are you know things like content delivery networks and, and sort of network optimizations that we're looking at as well okay and we know that the mpeg and itu who bought us mpeg4 obviously are working on hevc so high efficiency video coding which looks like the, the next generation i mean does, is that applicable to HD or is that too late for HD? Because I believe you need new decoders for that. Um, I mean, what's the market or where will we find a use for that? Well, high efficiency video coding in and of itself uh, is the target goal for that, by the way, is just like uh, with MPEG-4 ABC, the target goal was to be, for consumer applications was to be half the bandwidth uh, for the same picture quality as MPEG-2 video. And that is the goal, again, for HAVC is to be half again the... Uh, the bandwidth requirement for that. But beyond that, um, you know, ABC can handle HD just fine. It's really to reach it's uh, really to reach the extra dimensions that you can't go beyond that, such as full resolution 3D TV, which can't be handled very well by today's networks. Or actually, uh, we're starting to see coming forth uh, 4K television, which is now four times the resolution. I know it seems strange as people are just converting to high definition, but again, it's, it's the desire really to go from an artificial reality to be as close to um, your, 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 your regular reality with using through entertainment, and that's why they're looking at higher definition even beyond HD. Okay and where are we with HVC now in terms of it becoming a standard and how long before we're likely to actually see decoded outside out into the market? 
These, the standard itself is still in development. It, is, it will be technically frozen in the first half of 2012. And then, of course, there's a period of time where you're continuing the validation for that. The standard itself will be ratified, or it plans to be ratified, I should say, because, of course, like every schedule, you don't know the exact dates until uh, it happens, very early in 2013. With the silicon development times uh, the way they are, one could expect to see some new devices out towards the end of 2013, but it likely won't be mass marketed until about 2014. It really depends on the level of risk that a silicon manufacturer would want to take based on the maturity of the standard, because if you start too early, you might not get it uh, quite the way you want it to be. And really, it is the silicon part that, that makes a difference, because as you mentioned earlier, if, you, if you're going to use this new technology because it's uh, higher compression and it uses silicon technology to do that, then you have to wait to get new set-top boxes so you have then have the systemization of it afterwards. Okay, and it sounds like HEVC is really for the big screen experience. I mean, is that a fair way to characterize it, or is there any application for mobile or multi-screen? Yeah, it's actually both. Uh, the, 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 uh, the committee is looking at both a um, high efficiency profile, which is for like the larger screens or the, or the longer reach in like a DSL network, but also there's a low complexity. And the low complexity, what would be a way to reduce the amount of computational complexity you need for the mobile uh, or the uh, uh, the new you know, tablet uh, devices that are out there right now, so that you can get longer battery life. So, and that is a low complexity mode, which will probably be about the same um, bandwidth efficiency as as uh, as uh, AVC is today, but uses less power, so we get longer battery life. So it's a, actually an all-encompassing codec. It's just the next generation for that to get improvements for it. Okay, and also in terms of the sort of multi-screen market, we're hearing about MPEG Dash now, and obviously uh, adaptive bitrate streaming. Everybody sees the importance of that in terms of multi-screen, but uh, we've got this problem with lots of different versions. I mean, Paul, what's the uh, what's the goal of MPEG Dash? Well, I think you touched upon it there, really. We we, we we've already talked about the the growth in content and the and the number of the growth in the number of devices and different formats that are needed for each of these um, uh, for each of the different end devices, but we, we also have this additional problem today that um, with the new adaptive bitrate standards there are um, there are multiple multiple variants which are very very similar in much in, in, in many respects but are, but are incompatible which means that not only do we need these different resolutions and the different uh, and the different screen formats and what have you um, but we actually need these different containers as well and, and, and dash is really looking to to overcome that issue and provide a standardized Container format um, that means we can we, we can have it has the promise of having what one format that we can use to um, to carry all of these the, all of these different resolutions and formats and ultimately that will mean fewer variants that the that the, that the networks have to carry um, that should mean reduced bandwidth impact but also a um, a reduced operational overhead as well because there won't be multiple workflows for repackaging the same, effectively the same content. Okay, because we know you have to obviously do your different bit rates, and at the moment you do that multiple times. I mean, can we get down realistically to hit a whole market, every device in, out in the market, can we do that with one adaptive bit rate streaming uh, specification or format, and just that sort of six bit rates? I, I think we, 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 we'll see exactly how that, that pans out. I mean, the, the the, the one specification I think Dash, Dash has the potential of being the one, um, the one container specification. Um, ultimately, the, because of, because of the differences in devices, it's not always possible to have um, simply a number of different tiers to to address, for example, a large screen HD TV and a mobile phone. Although the, you, obviously you can encode things at different bit rates, um, those two devices are likely to actually need different productions. So. Um, so you probably you're, you're probably not at the panacea of thinking that, you know there's a very small number of, of, of streams that I'm going to need to hit all of these devices, um, but certainly by having a standardised container format, you can drastically reduce the number that you need to be moving around your network. Okay, and obviously at the moment it's Apple, Adobe, and Microsoft who kind of dominate the adaptive bitrate streaming. Mm. I mean, how do we move towards a standard? Are they involved in that, and um, are they going to be a sort of a key part of the intellectual property pool? And you know, is it realistic to try and uh, move the the industry forward in that way? Yeah, I mean, I think Microsoft and and, and Apple have been very um, instrumental in the in the standardisation process. Um, 
the standard is, is, is relatively young. I mean, it's got just at the point now where it's gone through the, the sort of final technical drafts. Um, so we'll start seeing implementations and I think real world deployments of that, of that coming up very, very quickly. Um, but really, the, from, from a consumer's point of view, there, there is no, there's no benefit from, from their, for their side to see, to see these multiple formats existing longer term. So I, I, I think the, um, the need to try to reduce complexity, the need to, to, to um, um, simplify some of these workflows and be able to put some of the, um, utilize some, some of the additional features that, that, that Dash provides um, as well will, will ultimately help us drive the, the, the whole industry towards this. I mean, some of the things we, you can do within Dash, for example, is that there's a standardized um, mechanism for having auxiliary information alongside the, um, the actual video chunks themselves, and that allows you to do um, things like faster channel change and um, having you know, the potential of standardized ways of doing ad insertion and those types of things in, into the stream as well. Um, and all of these things, the more standardization we can get there, the simpler the, um, the overall ecosystem will become. Okay. But just finally, in terms of just coming back to today now, I mean, what's priority number one right now? Is it still MPEG-4 and making that more efficient still? Well, we are still, obviously, MPEG-4 still is a... Um, is in a midlife, right? It's, it's nowhere near being replaced at this point in time. And every time you hear about a new technology, there's obviously there's a, there's a lot of um, interest to just jump right on that. It is continuing along the schedule. Uh, HEVC is, is continuing along the schedule that it's going to continue on. It's not going to go fast than that. And it is a natural evolution. If you take a look at MPEG-2, is roughly about uh, 10 years before AVC came out. And by the time HEVC is, is uh, ratified, it will be about another 10 years. And you can see where the technology is going in that time. So if you go along those lines, there are still uh, many or robust years uh, together for AVC to continue and be a very viable codec to be used moving forward. Where HEVC comes into play is really a, where there's a lot of st strong stress points. And also, uh, another market that we haven't really talked about here is that you know, part of the world really adopted high definition a little bit earlier than, than the rest of the world. So if you take a look at, uh, in Europe, for instance, where HD is predominantly, if not entirely, except for some, some small deployments, um, AVC already. If you look at the United States, which is quite a large market, it was an early adopter of high definition. It's on MPEG-2, so you can see the point where, uh, in the United States, the Advanced Television Systems Committee is looking at what do we do moving forward now, because obviously with MPEG-2 is a high, def high definition format, it's very bandwidth um, costly. So you can take something like HEVC and perhaps leapfrog AVC and go directly to HEVC in a, in, in a format moving forward, and that's just a natural evolution of the way things will happen. So I think you're going to see it, and actually, you're going to still see MPEG-2 out there as well. MPEG-2 video is not gone either. It really depends on the return on investment. There has to be a reason to go to a new codec, and it really comes down to return on investment. Where can you push it? If you're trying to offer, say, three or four high-definition channels, and you're an operator delivering on a DSL network, you simply, even with the advances in DSL, you simply need the most efficient uh, codec you can, and that's where you'll see... AVC or in the new 4K TVs or in the full resolution 3D. If you have an existing bandwidth and you have lots of bandwidth, do it and you, the current coder works fine. There's no need to move on. And that's really where you're going to see perhaps um, a segmentation of the market along those lines. Okay, all right. Well, <clears throat> it's good to see that uh, there's still plenty of uh, excitement left in compression. Absolutely. So, uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.